and say welcome to everyone who's joining us today on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. We have an exciting program today. Uh, we're going to talk about dragonflies and damselflies, specifically the ones in North America, um, and hopefully some specifically to, to Michigan as well. Uh, my name is Ellen Holstein. I'm the Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. Um, and I want to welcome everyone today on this, at least where I am, kind of cloudy day. So, all right, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I like to start off any program with just kind of some fun facts about whatever we're talking about. So we're going to do some true-false, all right? So my first true-false for everyone, and again, get out those chat fingers or the chat fingers on Facebook and try to answer these whether you think these statements are true or false. So our first statement, damselflies and dragonflies are found on every continent except Antarctica. So do you think that's true or do you think that is false? I see a true, I see a false, I see another true. I'll wait a couple more seconds. I see a true on a few other things. And yes, that is definitely true. Dragonflies and damselflies are found on every continent except Antarctica. All right, let's try our next one. Get you warmed up here. Damselflies and dragonflies are the most common state insect. What do you think? Is that true or is that false? I know, a little bit harder on this one, right? True, false, I see a little bit of both. I see a true, true. All right, and our answer. Actually, it's butterflies are the most common state insect. Michigan actually does not have a state insect. So Nevada has a damselfly, Alaska has a dragonfly, uh, Washington, the state, the green darner dragonfly. Uh, but Michigan, we had a few industrious people a couple of years ago and last year try to get the dragonfly as our state insect. So we'll see if that actually happens someday. All right, so let's try our next one. Some damselflies and dragonflies migrate to warmer climates, just like birds and butterflies. What do you think? Yeah, Michigan State insect definitely can be a mosquito as well. <laughs> do we think that's true or do we think that's false? What do we think? I see some trues. All right, let's see. And yes, it is true. Uh, some, some damselflies and dragonflies do migrate to warmer climates. One such one is the green darner dragonfly. Uh, and I love this little cartoon. I'm off to see the Great Wall of China. What about you? I'm off going to Disneyland. Uh, so it's not the same as birds and butterflies, where uh, at least birds, where they're going to do it all in their same lifetime. Uh, at least some of the dragonflies, they actually need two generations in order to do that migration. So, all right. What about our next one? Despite their large eyes, dragonflies and damselflies don't see very well. What do you think? Is that true or is that false? I see lots of falses. I see some trues, false, false. And the correct answer is false. Damselflies and dragonflies almost have 360 degree vision. So a lot of times we think of owls as having a great head turn, being able to see really far uh, to either side. Well, dragonflies, because of those huge eyes that they have, they can see almost all the way around except for right behind their head. So they have really great vision. All right, let's try our next one. Dragonflies and damselfly wings are operated together as one unit. So just like this, one unit. They need to operate at the same, can't have one higher than the other like that. So one unit. I see some falses, I see some trues. Awesome, I love you guys trying these out for me. And the answer is actually false. So dragonfly and damselfly wings can actually move independent of each other, which makes them such great flyers. And we'll go over that a little bit in, in, in the next couple of slides. All right, what about this one? Dragonflies can catch their prey more often than lions. So a lot of times we think of lions as being really great at catching their prey. But do we think dragonflies can catch them more often than lions? I see a lot of trues in there. And yes, it is true. So they actually catch their prey a lot more than lions do. All right, and I think this is our last one. Dragonflies are one of the oldest and largest known insects of all time. What do you think? Is that true or is that false? 
Yes, true, true, true. Definitely, it is true. Uh, the largest and the oldest insect of all time was a dragonfly. Its wingspan, so how far across, was about 27 to 29 inches. So that was a really, really big insect. So awesome, good job, you guys. All right, so let's now get more into a little bit, what is a dragonfly and what is a damselfly? And feel free to always put in the chat box, uh, feel free to, to answer, uh, ask questions throughout. I will try to monitor those uh, at the same time, but I may not get to your questions right away. All right, so dragonflies and damselflies are actually in the insect order. <laughs> Odonata, and I like to think the Odonata, 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 Odonata. Anyway, Odonata. So basically, Odonata means toothed ones. Um, and you can kind of see on the pictures here on the right, you see those teeth almost, or those sharp barbs that those uh, dragonflies and damselflies could eat with. So dragonflies and damselflies are both the only insects in that order. And there are over 5,000 species worldwide and over 160 dragonflies and damselflies here in Michigan. About 100 dragonflies and about 60 damselflies. Um, and just like every other insect, they're gonna have six uh, legs, they're gonna have two pairs of wings, they're gonna have a head, thorax, and abdomen. That's what makes an insect an insect, especially those six legs, right? So, and because they're called the tooth ones, dragonflies are carnivores. So they eat meat, a carnivore eats meat, so it's gonna eat other insects like mosquitoes. It might even eat other dragonflies and damselflies. So they're really great to have around, especially at this time of year when we have so many mosquitoes flying around, they're gonna help with that pest control. But again, that's where those teeth or that toothed one comes in. And they also have really great vision. So like we mentioned in that true false quiz at the beginning, uh, they have great vision. Not only can they see all the way around them, but they also have lots of little, it's almost lenses, so they have a compound eye. Just like butterflies have a compound eye, just like bees have a compound eye, they have these lots of little lenses within their eyes that they can see with. And actually, compared to humans, so humans actually can only see three different wavelengths of light. And with those three different wavelengths of light, we can see all the colors around us. But dragonflies can actually see many more colors, just like a lot of our other insects, like bees and butterflies. Uh, and they can also see ultraviolet light. So not only do they have lots of lenses in their eyes to be able to see even more, they have really big eyes, so they can see even almost right behind them, and they can see a lot more colors than we can. So all of that helps them to be able to see better and to be able to hunt better. Another cool thing about dragonflies that actually helps them hunt better is that they have a, a type of flight called, or type of wing attachment, I should say, where the wings attach directly to the flight muscles. Uh, in bees, on the other hand, the wings attach to basically the thorax or the body of the, the insect. And let me show you the difference between it. So when the wings are attached to the flight muscles directly, and as you can see in this video, you can see how the wings go up and down. But in a bee, when it attaches directly to the thorax, it's a totally different way of flying. And this, how this attaches for the dragonfly and the damselfly helps them be able to fly forward, fly backwards, fly up, fly down, maneuver mid air. If they see an insect that they wanna eat, they can maneuver mid air and calculate how to actually intercept that insect. So that's what makes them such great predators. All right, come on, stop, there we go. Another thing about their wings is that they have this mark at the end of their wings. So this is called the Petra stigma. Sometimes people just call it a stigma. If you ever look in certain books, you might just see the word stigma, but Petra meaning wing, stigma meaning mark, and it's basically this little pigmented part on the outside of the wing. And think of it like if you've got a paper airplane and you have a paper clip on that paper airplane, it gives weight to that paper airplane and it helps it fly a little bit better. It's the same thing as that petrostigma. It actually gives a little bit of weight on that wing and it helps them glide a little bit more and fly a little bit better. 
So both dragonflies and damselflies have their life cycle where they start off in the water. So they start off as eggs in the water, then they turn into larvae, and then they eventually molt, uh, basically shed their skin, and eventually become adults. But a lot of their life is actually underwater. So when we think of dragonflies and damselflies, they have something called incomplete metamorphosis. So they start off as an egg, they go to a nymph, and then they go to an adult. And the insects kind of look similar between the nymph and adult. I know they don't have wings, I realize that. But similar enough, whereas if they were to have complete metamorphosis, so such as a butterfly, they'd go from an egg to a larvae to a pupa, so that would be that cocoon stage or that chrysalis stage into the butterfly. So dragonflies have that incomplete metamorphosis. A lot of their life cycle is underwater, so dragonflies and damselflies can actually live as nymphs sometimes up to four years, whereas they may live as an adult up to about six months. Uh, so a lot more time is spent in the water. And they may molt between six to 15 times. So again, they're shedding their skin each time. They're just a little bit bigger of a nymph. So they're eating more and more and more. And they're actually eating, again, they're carnivorous even as a nymph. So they're eating other insects in that water. So hopefully mosquito larvae, right? Um, and eventually they crawl up onto a stem. They molt out of their last skin and then they emerge with their wings. Uh, and their wings may look like they're crumpled or they may look like they're injured, but they're just waiting for their wings to dry, just like a butterfly would be waiting for its wings to dry as well. So when they're in the water, one way that you can tell the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly is by what I like to call their tail, all right? So you're gonna look at the very end of them, right down here, and if it's a damselfly, it kind of has these long, almost gills, and they do call them gills, but long tails, almost. And they're kind of skinny in the body as well. But if they're a dragonfly, they're a lot chunkier in the body, so a lot more spread out in the body, and they don't have those little long tails. They're just very, very little at the bottom. So if you ever do any pond stuff and you, you take out insects from the pond, um, and you're looking through what you found and maybe you have some water striders. If you see something like that, you can tell a damselfly by a dragonfly, again, by those longer tails that they've got. Uh, and depending on which type of dragonfly and which type of damselfly you have out there, they may look a little bit different than the previous picture I showed, but they're all gonna have those longer tails for those damselflies and those little short stubby and more broader bodies for those dragonflies. And that translates also into when they're adults. So when damselflies are adults, they actually have a very slender body. You can kind of see in this picture here, it's much more slender than in this picture over here, this, the dragonfly. There's actually a gap between their eyes. So remember we had those big baseball-like eyes on the top of our head. If you are a damselfly, they actually have a space in between them. Um, and you can kind of see it in this picture here. Whereas if you're dragonfly, they're gonna be a lot closer together. They may even have, it almost looks like a seam right on the top of their head where they're touching each other, but they may be just a little bit separated, um, but they're gonna be a lot closer together. Their wings are also gonna be a little bit different. Uh, so if you look on the dragonfly wings, both of the wings, both the forewing as well as the hind wing are going to be a little bit broader at the base. Whereas on a damselfly, they're going to be a lot more slender at the base or a lot more narrow at the base. And my favorite way of telling the difference between a damselfly, because sometimes it's really hard to look at dragonflies and damselflies from far away and figure out what they are, um, when they are resting, so when they are on the ground, when they are on a leaf or any place that, like that, if the wings are more folded up, they're most likely gonna be a damselfly. If their wings are straight out like an airplane, they're most likely gonna be a dragonfly. So I kind of think of it like damselfly, the next letter in damselfly is an A, right? That A is kind of like the wings folded up, whereas dragonflies are like a big dragon coming through. And so again, this is when they are at rest. Uh, so that's probably the easiest way to tell the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly when they're an adult. All right, so what are parts of a dragonfly and a damselfly? 
Well, the main things that we need to think about, remember they have six legs because they're an insect. We have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, so that long part behind them. You have your four wings, so your wings at the front, and your hind wings, your wings at the back. And you have that petrostigma, which is right on that wing, um, which is gonna be that weight. Remember that paper clip on your paper airplane uh, on the wing? And you also will have what they call a notice, which is kind of like a notch on the wing. Um, so those are some characteristics that when you look in a guidebook or when you are looking through a book trying to figure out what you actually have, those are some characteristics that they're going to talk about. They're going to talk about what it looks like on the head, what it looks like on the thorax, what does it look like on the abdomen, do they have spots there, how long is the petrostigma, so that, that mark on that wing. Um, a lot of those things are what they're going to look at. And again, these numbers here on the abdomen are just segments. A lot of times they have 10 segments to their abdomen. So this is like segment number two, segment number three, four, five, six, seven, all the way out to 10. And so there might be some certain characteristics, especially in segment number two and three, that they might ask you to look for. All right. So the other fun thing about dragonflies and damselflies is they have something called sexual dimorphism. All right, big word, I know. I'm going to stay away from that word for the time being. But it basically means they have different colors for males and females. Um, and so just like a cardinal, a male cardinal is very bright and red and we know exactly what it is, a female cardinal is going to have more muted colors. And the same with peacocks. Well, that happens also in our dragonflies. So for example, in this dragonfly, the male is bright green and has a lot of some blue here, whereas the female is a more muted blue color. Or on our white-faced meadowhawk, it tends to have a very bright red color, whereas the female tends to be more of a muted orangish color. So it's really good to know if you have a male or if you have a female dragonfly uh, or damselfly, because that can also help you figure out what species you have. All right, last part in the weeds here. Um, so again, male and female, some ways to tell male and female. You have to get kind of really close to be able to tell. So males tend to have almost a bump, if you can kind of tell the bump on these, um, at those second and third segments on the abdomen. So remember I said they have that long abdomen and segments up to 10. Um, that's where you're looking for to tell the difference to, between a male and a female. You also can tell by how many appendages they have on their on their tail part or very much at the end of their abdomen. A damselfly is gonna have four, um, whereas a dragonfly is gonna have three if they're a male. These are really hard to see unless you're really close up. So I will give you some other things to look for later on telling the difference between males and females just by where they are. Um, but that is the most definite way to tell a difference if they're a male or a female. And their colors, um, the fun thing about their colors, their colors can actually change uh, depending on temperature a little bit. So these dragonflies and damselflies are very temperature dependent upon their environment. Um, so if it's a colder day, their colors might not be as vibrant. Uh, and so that will be a hard thing to figure out sometimes. Uh, but one cool thing about male and female dragonflies, you may have seen this wheel formation. This is how they mate. Uh, so they kind of almost make a wheel or a heart-shaped formation, and that is how they mate. Uh, a lot of times this is happening right by the water because they want to lay those eggs in the water because that's where they start their life cycle. All right, so get out those chat fingers again. We had a lot of information there, a lot of information. So I'm going to see if you remember, what's the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? So I'm going to show some pictures, and I want you to put in the chat box, do you think it's a dragonfly, or do you think it is a damselfly? All right, you ready? Let's get going. All right, this is my first one. Look at its eyes and look at its wings. Dragonfly or damselfly? Ooh, I see a lot of damselflies, a lot of damselflies. And the damselflies have it. Yes, definitely a damselfly. You can see that the, its eyes are a little bit more separated and its wings, when it's at rest, are folded up. All right, let's try our next one. Dragonfly or damselfly? I see dragonflies. I see two at least, four, more dragonflies. Yes, yes. 
dragonfly is definitely what this one is because again those eyes are closer together its wings you can tell a little bit in this one this its wings are broader as well as its body all right let's try a few more what about this one is it a dragonfly or is it a damselfly dragon dragon yes yes oh you guys are good yes definitely a dragonfly again those eyes are closer together the body is a lot uh, broader and its wings are also much broader and more out like an airplane all right try this one is it a dragonfly or is it a damselfly i see damselfly damsel damsel yes yes definitely damselfly Again, because those eyes are more separated, its body is more slender, and its wings are also more slender. You can't tell when they're flying as much because, again, they're going to fold up when they're at rest, um, but their wings are much more slender. And our last one here, dragonfly or damselfly? Oh, you guys are good. You dragon, dragon, dragon. Yes, dragon, most definitely a dragon. Again, its body is broader when it's at rest, its wings are out. Uh, so great characteristics. All right, are we feeling comfortable? Are we feeling comfortable in knowing our difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly so far? Yes, oh, I like that. Good vote of confidence. All right, so when we are looking for dragons and flies and damselflies, what we wanna look for is water. I know you might be thinking, wait a minute, I have seen them other places than water. But remember, a lot of their life cycle happens within the water, the egg, the larval stage. And again, a larval stage is a long time in their lifespan. So a lot of times when you want to find dragonflies or damselflies, you want to look near water, streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, any of these places. However, remember I said earlier, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between a male and a female. The, when you are not near water, and you see a dragonfly or a damselfly, a lot of time that, times that's gonna be a female or an immature adult. So it hasn't fully developed all of its parts that it needs to reproduce. Um, those are the ones that are usually gonna be found away from the water. If you are near water, uh, males tend to stay near the water. Males are much more territorial. They wanna protect their spot. They want to stay near the water because females pick those males for mating depending on their location. It's all about location, location, location. If they've got great real estate, the female will pick the male. So they want to hold on to that spot. Uh, so a lot of times they're going to stay near it. Yes, um, and I'll get to your question in just a bit. All right. Um, the other thing to look for is the time of day that you're looking for dragonflies and damselflies. So early in the morning, a cloudy midday or late afternoon are great times to look for dragonflies and damselflies. Um, they don't like it too hot. Think again, they are taking their heat or their temp body temperature from the environment. If it's too hot, not good. Um, so if it's in the mid afternoon or early afternoon, they're gonna be looking for more of those shaded spots because it's not going to be as warm. And the other thing, if it's windy, so if it's a windy day, they're actually going to go to the leaf side of a tree or an area that's not going to be as windy because that's where they're going to find its food. So that's when a lot of those little insects actually go over there to get its food. And so a lot of times that's where they're going to go as well to go get that prey. All right. All right. So before I get into the weeds here, a little bit of what is the difference between some of these insects? Somebody asked a question. So Susan asked, when trying to make your water feature good for dragon or damselflies in an Indiana winter, is it good to keep a floating heater in the water? It'll be fine otherwise. There's a lot of places that do not have floating heaters. Uh, there's a lot of other ponds and rivers that they're going to go in that they're not going to need it. You probably don't want them, even if they freeze over at the bottom or at the top, it's probably okay as long as they don't freeze completely. So, all right, um, and did I have another question by anyone? I think we're good. Oh. All right, so I am gonna just walk you through a little bit um, about our dragonfly families and our damselfly families. I'm not gonna get down to genus or species level. Uh, getting down to genus and species level, as I kind of showed you previously with the coloration and everything, is a little bit hard. You can do it, and I'll give you some resources at the end of this on how to do it. 
but I want to get you at least to the family level. All right. And so if we can at least get to the family level, that's going to whittle down a lot of other things. So we're going to start off on our damselflies. So our damselflies actually have only three families, insect families that you need to worry about. A lot more, a lot less than the dragonflies. I'll tell you that. So they've only got three. You want to think they have either a broad wing family, a narrow wing, or sometimes it's also called pond damsels, or spread wings. And when you're looking at these families, you want to, um, you want to think about their wings. You're, this is the time that you really want to look at wings is on damselflies. The broad wings are going to be, have a colored wing. The narrow wings are going to be more closed when they're, and clear when they're perched. And the spread wings, remember I said damselflies tend to keep their wings closed when they're perched or when they're at rest. Well, the spread wings have them out just a little bit, not all the way out like an airplane, like you would have for a dragonfly, but they are just spread just a little bit out. So not all the way together, all right? So let's go over a little bit the difference between these families. So our first family that we're gonna talk about is the broad winged, all right? So these are more large and showy, large for a damselfly. Again, as I said previously, the wings tend to be more colored. They have what they call broad wings with dense venation. Basically, the veins are really close together on their wings, if you can get that close. Um, they also have a notch uh, that is, lies farther out on the wing, so not as close to the body. They have long legs, so when you're looking at all your damselflies, look at how long these legs are on this guy. They're quite long, especially in this picture, you can see that they're quite long. And the fun thing about these guys is that when it gets hot out, they actually can point their abdomen, so the long part of their body, up towards the sun, and supposedly that helps cool them a little bit. But there's only seven of these species in the eastern U.S. Um, so there's not a lot of them, but they are pretty easy to tell because of all the damselflies, these are the ones that have those colored wings. They may just be colored a little bit here, uh, or the whole wing might be colored, but it's a pretty easy way of telling them. I thought I saw a question, but no, nope. okay, we're gonna keep going. All right, so that is our broad wings of our damselflies. Our next one is our narrow wings or our pond damsels. So these guys are gonna have wings that are clear, so not colored like the last one, and they're gonna be closed up when they're perched. So they're not gonna be spread out at all. They're smaller in size than our previous dragonflies. Uh, and they're more common in open ponds and marshes. So if you're in an open pond or in a marsh, that's where you're gonna find them. Their eyes, so if you look at the picture here on the left, their eyes are mostly black or brown. If you're looking from above, right here, you can see the black right there. And they're brightly colored from below. So you can see how colored they are right here. And up above, they have that black. And their face is actually paler than the top of their head. So looking at those facial features, if you can think of that as a face, um, is, is important for telling the differences on some of these. Their thorax also has a stripe on it. And what I mean is like right here, if you can see, this part of the body, that's that stripe. So a lot of times you see a stripe here or there's a stripe here. So this is a, a bluet, there's a stripe. This is the orange bluet and this is the skimming bluet. All of them have that stripe. And this one has more species than the last one. Uh, this one has 36 species in the Eastern US, but again, Look for those wings when you're looking at those different species. All right, and our third family when it comes to damselflies, our third family is those spread wings. So again, not spread out like the dragonflies, they're larger than the pond damsels, and they're partially spread out those wings. And you can see it a little bit, especially right here. And the petrostigma, so remember that's that part at the end of the wing that's that heavier part, think of it like the paper clip. That mark, it's a little bit longer than some of the other damselflies. They also perch with their abdomen more facing downward. So remember the last one kind of came up a little bit when it got hot. This one's more downward or more vertical when they're at rest. And the males tend to have blue eyes and a blue face. And you can see it especially right here. So here's a male, there's the blue eyes, and here's a female and there are kind of more orangish brownish eyes. So if you're looking at a male and you see blue eyes, and you know it's a damselfly, most likely, maybe, could be one of these spread wings, but that's why we give you lots of characteristics for it. Uh, and there's only 15 species of this in the Eastern US. 
Uh, so less than the last one, less than the narrow wing or pond damsels. Um, but really, when you're looking at damsels, you really want to look at the wings. That's your best indication which family it is. All right. So when it comes to dragonflies, um, dragonflies are a little bit different. We're not looking at the wings as much on dragonflies when we're trying to tell the difference. So remember, our damselflies had three families. We have seven insect families that we're trying to tell the difference between on the dragonflies. And I'll try to quickly get you through these. Uh, don't worry about taking notes after notes after notes. I will give you these particular slides so you have them if you wanna refer back to them, all right? So don't worry about taking notes really frantically. Um, you'll have this information after the fact. I'll put it in the chat box um, or I'll put it on Facebook as well. So, all right, so of the seven insect families, what you're trying to look for is how they behave basically. So are they perching a lot of the time? Are they staying on the vegetation and basically just going out and trying to get stuff? Or are they flying most of the time? Also, we need to look at the eyes and I'll tell you what that means. So basically, remember I said damselflies tends to have a big separation between the eyes? Well, dragonflies can have a separation, but it's just a small separation. And you can see it right here on this picture on the right, but the one above, it has that itty bitty bit of a separation, just kind of like a little nose in between almost, um, but it's not as far out on the sides of the head. So that's what I mean by separated. Um, whereas mo a lot of them or half of them will actually meet at the top. So those two ones meeting together. All right, so what I mean by perching versus flying. A percher basically spends most of its time on a perch and they will make short flights to go get its food. Just short flights and then they'll come back to the perch. A flyer is always moving, always moving around the pond. It usually makes loops. Uh, so perching, they can also be called sailors or gleaners because they're gonna make those short trips. But a flyer can sometimes be called a hawker is another word, or patrolling, because they're gonna keep going around and around and around the same water source. So that is a way to tell the difference Right off the bat, if you're seeing something that's continually circling around a water source, you already know that that takes out a few of your dragonfly families. But if you know if you're a percher, again, that, that helps identify things. All right, so our first percher that we're gonna talk about, we're first gonna talk mainly about the perchers and then we'll talk about the flyers. So our first one is called a petal tail. I love that these names are so descriptive, right? Uh, so a petal tail dragonfly is a percher. It's a little larger in size. And what I mean by size is the length, not the wingspan, the length of it. So it tends to be about two to three inches in length. Um, it's actually pretty rare here in the United States. There's only two species in the Eastern US and that's the gray and the black, uh, gray and black petal tails. So there's not a lot that you will actually find of these. Um, their eyes tend to be a little bit more separated, as I said previously. That little separation in between the eyes can really help you identify them. Their wings are clear and they have broad petal-like, basically reproductive parts on the bottom of the males. And you can kind of see them, I don't know if I would call them petals, but they, they kind of come out like petals right here. So when you're looking at the end of the abdomen, that's when you're gonna be looking for those petals. Um, so again, for the petal tails, there aren't a lot of these that we have to worry about. Uh, they tend to be uh, a pretty rare, but they have that wider separation and they are a percher. They're gonna stay in one spot and then they're gonna go out and get their prey. So that's what you're looking for. All right, so let's go on to our next percher. Our next one is the club tail. So look at this tail right here. You can see how much, uh, I keep calling them tails, abdomen, excuse me. Uh, look at the end of the abdomen right here and it's more bulbous, all right? So that's where you get that club idea. Uh, they, again, they try, they perch more. They're a little bit smaller than the petals, petal tails. Um, there also tends to be a little bit more camouflaged in color, but they have a, a wider, wider, a slightly wider separation than the, the petal tails. But they're still, again, they still come up more on the head. They're not way over on the side like the, the damselflies. Um, their wings are clear again, and you find these mainly in flowing water, so those rivers or those streams, and there are a lot more of these. So there are 98 species in North America 
Uh, and the great thing about the club tails is there isn't much of a difference between males and females, so you don't have to look for those color differences that you are gonna have to look for in some of the other families. Um, but again, for your club tails, you're looking for that more club-like abdomen at the end. Um, that's really the defining characteristic of this one. And it also perches. It's, again, gonna go just short distances to get it through. All right, and our last one that has tail in its name. Oh, here's a couple more uh, club tails, just to give you an idea. This one's not as defined in that club, but it is more uh, rounded at the end of their abdomen. So this is a sand dragon, and the one on the other side is called a snake tail. But again, it comes out a little bit more at the end. All right, or and here's a better picture here. All right, so our last one that has tail in the name is called spike tails. All right, so spike tails, a good way to tell the difference between a petal tail and a club tail and a spike tail, spike tails are flyers. They're gonna be flying around and patrolling that area and keep moving the whole time that they're around a water source and looking for its prey. They're also gonna be larger. They also tend to have some yellow stripes on their thorax, so on their main part of their body. And you can kind of see it in his, here, this picture right here. You see those stripes. Um, they also tend to have more green or blue eyes. It's really hard to sometimes tell eyes and immatures. So uh, dragonflies that have not yet fully developed their reproductive parts, their eyes sometimes are different. And so I don't always go by the color of the eyes. Uh, their wings are clear, but these guys are rarely seen because they're mainly found um, near forest streams. And so they're harder to find. And there's only eight species in all of the US. So if you're looking at all the ones that are petal tails, club tails, uh, and spike tails, you're more likely to see a club tail out of those three. And this is a twin spotted spike tail, just to let you know. And you can kind of see those little spikes on the end. Okay. All right, so let's get into our next type. So these are our darners. Our darners are actually a flyer. Um, so these are, again, another, just like those spike tails that are gonna fly around. They're larger in size. They have a long, slender abdomen, and somebody along the line thought it looked like a darning needle, so a needle. Um, they thought it was a little bit more narrow at the top, and so that's why they're called darners. <laughs> um, they often have multicolored spots on their abdomen, so lots of little spots on their abdomen here. Here's a female versus a male green darner. But these eyes meet right at the top. So remember all the other ones that we talked about, they kind of had a little separation, they meet right at the top. They almost have like a seam at the top. Uh, their wings are clear, and there are 39 species in North America. The green darner uh, dragonfly, excuse me, are ones that actually do migrate. Um, and so they do go to other areas, just like birds or butterflies. All right, so after our darners, we get our cruisers. Another name for a bee would a, a river cruiser. Uh, so can you tell where they, they live? They like to live in rivers, right? Um, so they are also a flyer, just like the darners. They fly up and down streams and rivers. Uh, hence the name river cruiser or cruiser, right? They have a large size and they also have their eyes that meet at the top of their head, just like the darners do, all right? They have long legs. Remember that one damselfly that had the long legs? These guys also have longer legs. Let's look at these guys. You can see the legs there compared to, oh, you can kind of see the legs here, a much shorter leg here on the darners. So they have much longer legs. They have, um, their wings are clear. They tend to be a brownish to blackish color in the body, uh, but they do have a stripe. They do have one single stripe on their abdomen and you can si kind of see it right here. This is a stream cruiser, uh, but there are nine species in North America that are those river cruisers or those cruisers. Um, so we haven't even gotten to the ones that have the most species. All right, we have two more to go. This is our emeralds. All right, so emeralds. I usually think of emeralds, I think of green. All right, so that's what you're thinking about here. They are, again, another flyer. They're gonna be larger. They have a brown body, just like the river cruisers do. Sometimes they have some iridescent to it or a shiny metallicness. Um, and these guys, tend to have green eyes. Remember, they're called emeralds. However, if they're young, they're gonna have more red-brown eyes. So that's something to be aware of. But they do meet at the top of the head. So if they have those bright green eyes and they meet at the top of the head like that, um, there's a good chance that they're an emerald. Uh, they actually can be difficult to find. They're pretty secretive. 
Uh, so they breed in aquatic habitats, uh, but more aquatic habitats that are more rare, like bogs. Uh, but there are 49 species in North America, so there are quite a few. It's just harder to find them um, out of all of them. So, all right. And then here are a few other emeralds that you might find. But again, so this is a male. This one has more reddish eyes, and this, I believe, is more of an immature. Whereas this is a Heinz emerald uh, dragonfly. They have more of the green eyes. But this is actually a endangered species uh, here in Michigan as well as in Ohio. Um, so this species is not found in very many areas and so it is a protected species. Uh, so again, uh, one of, more of those more rare ones and a more limited uh, range that it actually can live in. And for that reason, it is endangered, unfortunately. All right, and our last family are our skimmers. All right, so our skimmers can be perchers, they're mainly perchers, perchers, but they can be flyers as well. They are very common. There are 103 species of skimmers that we have, and they can be the whole range of colors. Uh, their eyes do meet on top of their head, but here are the tricky guys. These guys tend to have more different male and female colors, uh, and you can see this right here on our common whitetail, the differences in the colors. They're Abdomens, at least in the males, tend to be more tapered. Uh, so a saying for it is tapered tails and dragon males. Uh, these are the harder ones. These are more common. So if you're going to find any dragonfly and they're going to be perching um, and it looks, they have those eyes together, it's a good, and they've got a broad body again, it's a good chance you're going to have a skimmer. Um, so here's some other examples of skimmers. Uh, again, you see the male versus the female. Uh, this is a four-spotted, an amber wing, male versus female. Um, I have a couple more here. A Halloween pennant. This is, there's kind of fun names here. Male versus female. A dot-tailed white face. Again, male versus female. But these bodies, again, it almost reminds me of a darner in a way. So these guys are your tricky guys. Um, Eastern pond hawks. So if you've ever heard of pond hawks or meadow hawks, they are your skimmers. Um, and they tend to be a little bit larger. So again, male versus female and male versus female. All right. Oh, I got a couple more, sorry. Our saddlebacks, so male versus female, as well as our wandering gliders, male versus female. So those are our families. So again, we have three damselfly families and we have uh, seven dragonfly families. So I know, lots of information, a little bit of a fire hydrant here, but let's see how much we have retained. Let's see how much we've got here. So we're going to try a quiz here. In a way, it's a fun quiz. No worries if you get it wrong. So male, or who am I, all right? So look at this guy. First, we got to identify, is it a dragonfly or a damselfly? And you can write this in the chat if you want to, or if you just want to think it in your brain, all right? Oh, geez, somebody already knows what it is, right? <laughs> All right, so, uh, yep, we've got a dragonfly. Uh, so first off we look, it is perching, all right? So that can eliminate some of our dragonfly families. Second, it's got those wider separated eyes. So that's gonna be one of our tails, our, our club tail, our petal tail, or our spike tail. It's got clear wings, okay, we like that. And it's abdomen is club shaped. So somebody totally got it and it's a club tail. It's actually a spiny leg club tail, so you, you were totally on when it came to a club tail dragonfly. Uh, it is a spiny leg club tail, just because look at the spines on its legs, but definitely a club tail. Really good job. I love that you knew that right away, Carolyn. That's awesome. All right, so who am I? First, remember, identify, are we a dragonfly or a damselfly? Look at its eyes, look at its wings. All right, so definitely a dragonfly. All right, so we've got that down. Now, we know it's a flyer, just because we were, we were watching it, right? It's a flyer. <laughs> There's my clue for you. Uh, so we know it can't be any of those, those first two tail ones. Got a mostly brown body. All right, so we've got a couple of guesses here. The eyes do meet at the top of the head, and you can kind of see that. And it's got green eyes. Yes, you definitely honed in on those green eyes. So it is an emerald. It's actually called a clamp-tipped emerald. Um, but that's when those green eyes are true. Uh, this would be, I think, more of a female versus a male here. All right, so let's try another one. I've got two more for you. 
All right, so damselfly or dragonfly? What's what's our difference here? Damsel, yep, damsel, definitely a damselfly. It's got blue eyes. That should be a little bit of clue. Clear wings, a long pair of stigma. Wings are partially spread when perched. Oh, that should be a big clue, right? Yep, spread wings. So it's a sweet flag spread wing is the name of that one. And our last one, who am I? Dragonfly or damselfly? Yep, and it's a male, very true. Because I wanted those, those blue eyes. All right, yep, dragon. And you can tell by the wings and the eyes. It is a flyer, there's my clue on you. It's hard to tell on pictures. Uh, but they also vertically perch, so that's a hint. Eyes meet on the top of the head. There are colored spots on the abdomen, and look at the shape of that abdomen. Long, slender abdomen. Kind of looks like maybe something my mom might have sewn with. All right, there we go. Darners, this is a springtime darner. Um, so this is another darner. It's got that narrower. So somebody thought it looked like a darning needle. All right. So some of our threats to our damselflies and dragonflies, people were kind of talking a little bit about this in the chat, um, but definitely habitat destruction. So when we switch our wetlands to more of an urban environment, we're gonna be losing some of our dragonfly and damselfly species. For example, the, the Heinz Emerald. Um, climate change could also be a big threat to these guys because they need that wet environment, especially when they're in that larval stage or that egg stage, they need that environment. And any pollution that you get into that water is gonna harm them. Um, and so those are the main threats. All right, here we go. So resources, this is where you go. So how to observe and identify. So a great way to observe and identify, binoculars. You can get close up, you can see those little features. And you remember, they have such great eyesight. If you get too close, they might fly away. So photography is another great way of observing them and trying to identify things because again, you can, especially with a really good zoom, you can get really close up and you can also take a picture and then look at it later to be able to identify. You can also try capturing with a net. Now the problem with capturing with a net, you need to go from behind and below because remember those eyes are so good, they can see all the way almost to the back except that one blind spot in the back of their head. So go from below and behind. Um, and you can also try to walk through grass to scare them up, especially if it's a percher. If it's a flyer, so the, some of those flying dragonflies, you can watch its flight pattern and try to ambush it. Um, but again, go from below and behind. You do wanna be careful, uh, the large ones can bite. Now, when I'm talking about bite, they'll give you a good pinch. They're not gonna really draw blood, but they'll give you a good pinch. Uh, some of these dragonflies and damselflies can eat another dragonfly and damselfly. And so they've got some good, good mouth parts. Remember, they're called toothed ones, right? Um, and so you do want to think about that when you're doing it. Um, but don't chase them. Because remember, they've got those great wings. They can outmaneuver you at any chance. So um, uh, unlike when we go after butterflies and we can go with the net and we try to chase the butterflies with the net. I love watching kids do this, by the way. Uh, you don't wanna do it with a dragonfly or damselfly. They're gonna win. More often than not, they're gonna win. So, all right, books. My favorite book is probably the one on the left. Uh, it's kind of a heavy book, I do have to warn you, but it's got some really great pictures. It shows you the male and females in this. Uh, it shows you sometimes the immature ones. So those are some great books. Um, there are some great apps out there. One is called the Dragonfly and Damselfly Fly Field Guide. It's a little bit older. They haven't updated recently, but you can search by color, habitat, and size. You can zoom into pictures, so it's great for pictures, and it's connected to a community of people that love dragonflies and damselflies. The bad thing is it can't, you can't submit an observation without linking it to, directly to all the way down to species level. There is some missing text, and it is grouped by region. So what I mean by that, when you are looking, I have to pick, for example, for Michigan, Chicago region. Um, and once I pick Chicago region, I can use this little icon at the top. And this is a free app, so you wouldn't have to pay for it. And I can search by the size of the dragonfly um, or damselfly. I can pick up to two different habit, habitats. And I can also pick up to three different colors to get me down to a particular species. Um, and that's really great. The bad thing is, or a good thing, um, it does give you some great pictures, which I love, but sometimes it doesn't have the text form. It hasn't been completely filled out. So when it's a good resource, it's not a complete resource, all right? 
So that's one. Um, it, it also has an online platform. So there's a website that you can go to as well that um, can give you some more information as well. The other one that is really good is iNaturalist. I love iNaturalist. So if you haven't ever downloaded iNaturalist onto your phone or onto your tablet or anything, I would totally recommend to do so. It's another free app and it does both plants and animals. Um, and you can create projects. New species have been discovered by this app, uh, using this app. Um, there are, some things are harder to identify uh, depending on how you take the picture. So uh, you could have to make an account for this one. Um, but it's really easy to do so. Just put in your name and a password. Um, and basically, if you can take a picture, you can use this app. Um, that's all you need is to be able to take a picture. Uh, so you go into the app, you pull it up. These are just from off of my phone. You click the observe button. You, you, this is of a plant, obviously. You click next. But when you take that picture, make sure it is a good picture. It's not out of focus. It's not too far away. There's not a lot of other things in the picture. That can hard, be hard to do sometimes on your smartphone. Um, but once you have that picture, you look and you see, it'll give you, we think it's pretty sure in this genus, and then it'll give you your top 10 suggestions, all right? Um, sometimes it'll say, I am not sure what this is. It'll still give you a top 10 suggestions, but you wanna be really careful with that identification. Um, and again, you can scroll down to see more suggestions. Um, and then it'll give you, just like the other one, it'll give you some pictures and it'll give you some information about it, which is great. Um, you do want to have your location services on or at least show where you are because where you are can really um, help you identify what species you have. Uh, a lot of species are very particular in where they go. And so that's definitely going to help narrow things down. Um, you can upload things after the fact. So you can take, if you're taking pictures with a camera, just a regular camera or with a zoomable lens, you can upload them online on their website and that'll help as well. Um, but the interesting thing about this one is that once you take a picture, once you put out what you think it is, then basically someone else will look at it and say, yes, I think it's this, or no, I think it might be something else. And so it's a great resource for you to interact with people and double check your work. When you're looking at a book or when you're looking on the other app, nobody is double checking your work. Nobody's saying, I think it's something else or yeah, I agree, I think it's that. The great thing about iNaturalist is that it does that. Um, and as I said, it can help science as well. It will let us know where these things are. So I actually made an iNaturalist project for this class. Uh, and in this project, I started it today. So basically from today until next Friday, go out there, download iNaturalist if you don't have it on your phone. As I said, it's a free app or on your tablet and start taking pictures of dragonflies and damselflies and trying to see what they are. The best way to learn is to just try doing things. Um, and so once you take a picture, it's actually gonna automatically go into this project if it's a dragonfly or a damselfly. Um, but if you want to actually become prior to the project, you just go onto the website, click under projects. You actually have to search for this one under virtual bio blitz dragonflies because there's a lot of dragonfly stuff out there or damselflies, either one will work. Um, as I said, you can sign up, but it'll automatically go into projects. Um, this just shows you that it's on mine as a project. But this is what it looks like from today. So this was from noon today. Uh, so somebody, some people have already been taking pictures of dragonflies and damselflies. Some are really good, as you can see right here. We got all the way down to Meadowhawk. Others are really far away, so it's really hard to tell what that is, right? So again, it tells you that pictures matter. Um, it also will tell us who has the most observations, the most species, what species has been the most observed. So the blue dasher has been the most observed. Um, and I wanna make a game out of this. This is my challenge for you guys. Um, see who can get the most observations, the most species, and the rarest species, all right? So my winner from my last BioBlitz that we had was on climbing plants, and Jackie was our winner that actually attended the class. So there are other people that will be using this, um, and these are just some of the stats that we got from last time. But uh, Jackie did win uh, that one, so yay Jackie, she found she made six observations and six species. And so it's kind of fun to just try things, right? All right, so here's my advice from a dragonfly and I'll try to then answer some of your questions, but I tried to get through this today. So advice from a dragonfly. 
spend time near the water, be colorful, enjoy a good read, zoom in on your dreams, appreciate long summer days, um, keep your eyes open and just win it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to type into the chat box um, the link to the slide. So you should get it. It would be www.rebrand.ly backslash Odinata. Um, and I can also put in the actual file. Let's see, maybe, nope, I can't on this one. Um, but that is basically how you get. So rebrand.ly.odinata. Um, and these are some of the books and resources that I have used that I enjoy, but you can find what you like. All right, so let's see what I have in the chat box and in the question and answer. Uh, does the dragonfly always need humid atmosphere or can they live in dry and hilly areas? Uh, so I kind of answered this a little bit in the past. Uh, they do need a wet area in order to breed. Uh, so they do need that wet area in order to complete their life cycle, but you can find them in dry, hilly areas, but those tend to be more the females and tend to be more the immature ones. Um, let's see, will touching their wings damage them like butterflies? No, that will not damage them like butterflies. Butterflies have scales on their wings that, that come off. It's not so much on the, the dragonflies and damselflies, but you do want to be careful with their wings as well, because that's what they use to get around and survive. So um, let's see. Why are dragonflies and damselflies so friendly? For example, when I kayak or hike, they always seem to land on me with no problem or fear. Well, they're just checking you out, right? Uh, they are trying to get their prey, so maybe something is flying near you, for example, a mosquito or something else that they want to eat. Uh, so they're just checking you out. They're not going to hurt you at all. Uh, let's see. Can mosquito dunks harm dragon or damselfly larvae? Hmm, I'm not sure what a mosquito dunk is. Um, but if, the, if it's not moving, I, I assume that is where you would drown mosquitoes. Um, but if they're not moving, they're probably not going to bother with them. Uh, they're really good at getting their dra dragonflies and damselflies. Oh, the project name, let me back up for example. The project name for iNaturalist is it's just Virtual BioBlitz Dragonflies and Damselflies. So if you're basically, I made it for the whole US because I'm not knowing where people were coming from. If you take any pictures in iNaturalist that is a dragonfly or damselfly, it will automatically be loaded into this project. Um, if you want to specifically join the project, you can definitely do that as well. Um, and as I said, just look for virtual bioblitz dragonflies and damselflies. And thank you for joining the project. Um, by the way, that kills mosquito larvae. Oh, I'm missing some of these here. Um, we just made a butterfly puddler to attract butter uh, to attract butterflies. Is there something equivalent that we could make to attract dragonflies and damselflies? Water. Um, so I've heard of some people making ponds. They need to be of a particular size. I don't remember right now. Look online what the size. But you do, they do need water in order to complete their life cycle. And so if you made a big pond or if you had enough space to make a big pond, that would attract dragonflies and damselflies. I don't know. There's not really a feeder unless you're out there attracting lots of mosquitoes and they notice that you're attracting lots of mosquitoes. That would be the best way of doing it. Ah, from Facebook, uh, which dragonflies and damselflies migrate? Oh, actually, it's a really good question. Let me actually get, um, get out of this for a second. Oops, uh, and I'm gonna share my screen again in just a minute. So there are five dragonflies and damselflies that actually love to migrate. And let me just share my screen for a second one more time so you can see which ones. All right, so these are the five that love to migrate, um, are, are most migrating species that we know of. So the five most widespread migrants are the common green gardener, the black saddlebags, the wandering glider, the spot winged glider, and the variegated meadowhawk. So those are the five that really, um, that we know go pretty far, uh, especially the green gardener. Um, that's one in the US that goes really far. There are 11 other species that are considered migratory, but it, they're not as widespread. If you are interested in migratory uh, dragonflies, actually a great place to go is the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership. 
Um, and you can actually become a citizen scientist or a community scientist, whatever you want to call it, and help scientists actually monitor these dragonflies and damselflies. So if you have a pond that you go to all the time or some sort of water that you go to all the time, um, you can look for these five and scientists would love you helping them out. So, and let me go back to my resources just to make, and I've got that right here on, um, on this page. It's the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership. All right, let's see if we've got any other questions. I know it is five. Um, it's actually 5.04, I apologize for taking up too much of your time. Um, but if anybody else has any more questions, I'm willing to stay on for another so many minutes. Oops. Um, but otherwise, thank you guys. Hopefully you got access to the, the, rec um, the slides. As I said, I will try to put up this recording on YouTube as well. Um, excuse me, not on YouTube. Yeah, on YouTube, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, as well as a link to the resources. So that way you guys can find out more about dragonflies and damselflies. And thank you so much for joining us. I know it's hard on a four o'clock in the afternoon or a three o'clock, depending on where you're joining us. So I do appreciate you learning more about our wonderful friends. So thank you very much. As I said, any, if anybody has any more questions? Oh, we saw green darners migrating uh, along the Atlantic coast. Yes, and those are the ones that fly quite far. Those are also the ones that have two generations. So it takes two generations for them to make the whole migration. So it's not like the whole, the same one, the same individual. So that's a pretty cool fact about that one. Uh, just checking for a second. Okay. And I think that's all the questions I have here. Any other questions on Facebook? Awesome. Yeah. Check out our YouTube channel. Check out also what we have uh, coming up. So we do have a lot of stuff coming up. And as I said, if you're a family, you've got grandchildren, you've got children. Uh, I've got another presentation just on dragonflies, not as intense on the identification, more on how cool they are um, and their flying ability that I will be doing next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And that's a lot of fun. We tried to add in more movement to that one. <laughs> you can't do this with kids if you don't add movement, so. So thank you guys for joining us. I don't see any more questions. Uh, so that being said, I am gonna close down the session. Oh, did we get a raised hand? Give me a second here. I will try to let you talk. You can talk if you would like. Just one quick question. Is that um, Dragonfly presentation next week also going to be on Zoom? It is. So you can either join us via Zoom uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, and you can get a, if you go on our Facebook page, there should be a link to, to sign up on Zoom. And I would recommend signing up because it's been filling up pretty quickly. And I can only take 100 people at a time, unfortunately. Um, but I will also live stream that on Facebook Live as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yep, not a problem. Excellent presentation. Appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. I think Ella also has a question. So Ella, if you would like, I tried to give you permission to talk. But you have to unmute yourself if you want to do so. I can only give you permission. So I just saw a hand raised. So all right. Well, Ella, do you would you like to talk? All right, well, thank you guys for joining us. Oh, where do I go to sign up for the lichen presentation? Uh, two places you can go. You can either go to Pierce Cedar Creek Institute's Facebook page, um, and under the events tab, you will see virtual bio blitz. Um, and I think I called that one, do you like lichen? I actually love lichen, so I should have put love, but, uh, and you can sign up there. There'll be a link there, or you can go to cedarcreekinstitute.org. Uh, that is our webpage for Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. And there as well, there should be a link to sign up for that one as well. And that is August 6th, so another Thursday. And I'm really excited about that one because uh, my background is in fungi. I really like my fungi and lichen is partially fungi, so. Oh, thank you, Sarah, for putting that in there. Awesome, great. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me. Have a great day. And looks like tomorrow will be a great day to go look for dragonflies and damselflies. So don't forget about that project and please, uh, try to practice what you learned today. So thank you guys for joining us and I hope you learned something new.
Bye.